last this summer. conference will now be recorded. Um, so anyway, welcome everyone. This is the first time for us to do it this way. Uh, usually we, I show the movie and we talk afterwards, but um, being as things are the way they are, um, I think this is, this is great. And um, so when I first thought about doing a, a film chat, I immediately thought of Doug Wilson, um, who were both on the, the library board. And because I've always wanted to turn to him during a library meeting and just say, okay, what's your favorite sports movie? Tell me. Um, because Doug Wilson is legendary uh, director, producer, um, over 50 years with ABC Wide World of Sports. Um, I just got so excited when I discovered that, that I, <laughs> telling Doug, I came home and told the kids and we watched YouTube videos of um, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And I have to also say, I just finished his book, um, The World Was Our Stage, Spanning the Globe with ABC Sports, and I highly recommend it. I bought two, two of them from off of Amazon. So um, anyway, so when I did ask Doug, okay, so what's your favorite sports movie? he kind of hesitated and he said, well, you know, it's the hustler and, you know, pool is a sport, but it was this kind of interesting, you know, I, I kind of watched the wheels kind of turn thinking, you know, is it a sport? It is a sport. Um, so um, I was so excited because it's one of my all time favorite movies. So I got to rewatch it and started just really thinking about, um, about this classic, classic film, which is 60 years old. And Doug and I agree, it is not dated at all. It's it's extremely powerful film. So um, with, uh, Doug, you wanna take it from there? We can start. Good, Doug. Katie, thanks for the nice words <laughs> and the fun of the book. <laughs> and I'm also, while, while we're here, my nose my <laughs> Author Jody Cohen has joined us. She's out in California, and I think she's on the. She's on the. There she is waving. Oh, hey, Jody! Nice to meet you. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, uh, we have we have Californians represented here. I wondered how many uh, people uh, that are here did, did any have a chance to look at the movie before recently. You did look at it. Good. Well, then, very good. Very good. It, then you know, it's hard to believe. As Katie referred to it, it's 60 years since it premiered in, in the Washington, D.C. on, I think it was 21st of September, 1961. And it still, uh, it still works. There's nothing, it's ageless. It really is ageless. And that, to me, puts it in the absolute category of a classic movie. I think it's rated in a number six in the all time great sports movies uh, in, in one of the, one of the uh, uh, lists. Um, I, it, I mentioned that it, it uh, premiered uh, in September, but it was actually the first screening of it was underwritten by Richard Burton on Broadway. <laughs> yeah. he, yes. He had, knew about the movie, and he wanted the people who he wanted all the people who were in Broadway shows to see it. So he did a screening, and what that screening did, up until that time, uh, 20th Century Fox hadn't been high on the movie. They hadn't really uh, uh, promoted it very much and gotten behind it in a big way. But the word of mouth happened after after Richard Burton's screening. And they ended up really putting a lot of money and a lot of uh, promotional effort behind the movie. Um, it did get nine Oscar nominations, and it won only won two: one for decoration, and one for cinematography. Oh. Yeah, but none, none of the actors and the director, none best move, best picture didn't they didn't win. He did win was, a gold, Golden Globe, though. Uh, he got Best Actor, I think, for Golden Globe and Best Picture, and they, they got a lot of other awards. 
but the Oscars escaped them, and I think that was a big mistake on the on the Academy's part, in my opinion. Yeah. Because it's proved itself. Now I wonder if you all remember something like this. Bum ba bum 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 spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety <laughs> of sport, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, the human drama of athletic competition. This is ABC's Wide World of Sports. That's my patch. <laughs> but, well, if there was ever a movie that fit those definitions, this is it. Uh, the thrill of victory is a little bit uh, tarnished in a sense because you don't you don't leave the film. I'm sure you all left the film satisfied and felt that the good had overridden evil. But because of the tragedy toward the end of the movie, the uh, thrill of victory is a little bit tainted. It's not quite as thrilling as as if you just won the Grand Prix of Monaco or something. Um, I. I uh, let me tell you about how I approached the movie uh, when I first uh, went to see it. I had an I, ID card, an employee ID card from ABC, because I was working obviously for ABC at the time. And um, the uh, ID card was also uh, got us into Paramount Theaters free. And so, so the Hustler was playing on the Paramount Theater in Times Square. And one Sunday afternoon, my late wife and I decided to go see the movie because because Paul Newman was in it. I had no idea what a hustler was. I didn't have any idea what it meant at all. So we went in and sat down, and the movie unfolds, as you all who saw it recently know. This, this old Packard car comes into a sort of downtrodden village and uh, and they get out of the car and go into a into a billiard parlor, and um, the that shot, by the way, was filmed in Yonkers, New York. <laughs> just one one little shot of Yonkers, New York. But then when they go in, just to refresh our memories a little bit, they get into conversation with the bartender, and they establish the fact that they're going to a company outing in Pittsburgh. And he's uh, 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 and he says, "Oh, you got a three-hour drive." Uh, it's a, and then that means the fast Eddie Felsen, the Paul Newman, says, uh, "Oh, we have time to play billiards, to play some pool." And they start playing, and he starts drinking, and he feigns the fact he's getting drunk. And then, as you all remember, the impossible shot gets 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 set up. And he sinks it, and then his partner, Myron McCormick, Charlie was his character name, Myron, Myron McCormick says, oh, boy, that's lucky. That's a one shot in a million. And he said, I could do that again. And he's acting more drunk. And he says, no, you couldn't. And he says, okay, and they, they bet. And he tries it, and he misses on purpose. We see, we, we don't know that he's missing on purpose at that point as an audience, but we see him missing the cue ball even went off the table, as I remember. And and uh, then he says, no, I can do it. Set it up again. Myron McCormick doesn't want to have any part of it. He says, I'll meet you in the car. And the bartender starts to bet against him. And then the whole room bets against him. And there's a big pile of money on the table. And there was a great, big, great shot of Paul Newman sort of shaking, shaking his head a little bit to get to concentrate. And he hits it. Of course, it goes in. He scoops up the money and goes out the door. And I and I sat there in the Paramount Theater, going, "Holy smoke! This is <laughs> unbelievable! I don't, uh. I don't believe that I just saw what I just saw. This has got to be a great movie." And then it just started. It isn't a great movie because it's about billiards. It's a great movie because it's about relationships. It's about a, a, a character growth, a character. Uh, development, especially in Fast Eddie. <laughs> Excuse me. I want to say, give you a quote from Paul Newman himself about the character development. He says, Fast Eddie went from the core of his character to be about hustling to the very core of his character to be about what he had to do with a sense of honesty and integrity. That came from Newman himself. 
I would also throw in there a little bit of love <laughs> because what changed him a lot was the woman who took care of him when he was uh, when he had his thumbs broken. But well, I, I digress. Let's move. Through. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move through the movie a little bit. The uh, agony of defeat, where where he loses and passes out at the end of the match after 24 hours of straight pay, playing, unbelievable. And and uh, wasn't Jackie Gleason fabulous? <laughs> yes, he was. Just fabulous. And you only see, you know, he's only the movie is two hours and 14 minutes long. He's only on the screen for 20 minutes of the movie. And he doesn't say that much. Oh, he doesn't but at he's all. Such a, he's such a force. I mean, he's got he's got such a you know uh, um, right. sort of fans. Uh, yeah. He does that boutonniere in his collar and his, mm -hmm. his coat and, and, and the and the rings on his fingers and all. He was fab fabulous. Well, long comes. The sense of well, the evil. If there's evil in the movie, if it's evil, good against evil. Why, uh, Burt Gordon in the in the actor of George C. Scott enters the scene. And remember, he calls Eddie Pence, Eddie Bell, Bell, he calls uh, Paul Newman a loser. Mm -hmm. That's where he starts, and he characterizes him as a loser. And he proves himself to be a loser, actually, because he blows it all in the end of a. Uh, uh, he's he's up. I think it was eighteen thousand dollars. He was up eighteen thousand dollars in nineteen sixty one. Wow, that's a lot. That was really a lot of money. Not that it isn't considerable today. No. But <laughs> excuse me. But he uh, he ends up only all he cared about was beating. Minnesota Fats, and he and he kept saying the game is over when Fats says it's over. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and then then George C. Scott's underwrite. He's he's underwriting the, the whole thing because he's a he's a parasite. <laughs> <laughs> he's a leech, living off other people's uh, uh, talents. But he says to keep playing him because he's a loser, and he and he was he, his prediction was right at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, then now, Fast Eddie is down and out, and along comes <laughs> Hyper Lori. <laughs> oh boy, the the scenes of of, of Piper Lori uh, in the in the bus. Uh, turn are really really strong. I, I there are, there are, there are moments in the movie where I was really jarred or brought in. One of them was when she stands up after their conversation. She stands up and you see that she's crippled, that she's lame. And uh, apparently she had trouble uh, faking that limp. He tried at one point apparently to put marbles in her shoe <laughs> <laughs> to. Uh, to uh, help her with a limp, but but the director, Rossin, uh, didn't want the want the uh, the uh, disability to override her character. So he he didn't have her limp that badly. He had her limp a little bit. She got along okay. At any rate, as we all watched, we all watched the. Uh, uh, I don't have to say what it was, but they eventually. Have uh, are loving each other every day, and then he goes out and gets into deep trouble where he gets his thumbs broken. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something about this that that I I wanted to mention that the the director again, Robert Rawson, left a lot to the imagination. Today, if you were making a movie about a love scene like that, there'd be a lot of flesh. You know, <laughs> prob probably, and this you didn't need that. It would have cheapened the movie, if in my opinion, if they'd done if he'd shot it that way. If you'd seen them make love, and and uh, and when he when he had his thumbs broken, for instance, you weren't on a close up. You were in a long shot, looking through a panel. 
And, the, and what, yeah, what gave you the mode, the feeling of it was his scream. I thought that was brilliantly done. And today, I don't think it would have been shot that way. I think it would have been, they tend to want more, well, bad acting. It, it was really freaky. And, and, and for a little bit, couldn't really tell what happened to him. It wasn't until he came back to the apartment and said what happened. So for that lag time, my imagination was mm -hmm. racing. I had no idea. That was worse. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. And, and then, the way it builds, you know, things are not going right because Fast Eddie just loses his his cool. I mean, right. again, he acts like a loser. You know, yeah. he just loses his cool. The hustle goes wrong, and you can feel it building, building, and until yeah, it's so it's done. Well, it's so artful. Totally correct. It really was. Really was. And then what happens to uh, Piper Laurie? She has the happiest days of her life <laughs> because she's now taking, she has a purpose in life to take care of him. And because he can't button his buttons, he can't pick up a cup, he can't do anything. She's gonna, and remember, remember when she came back from shopping and she said, I wanted to tell everybody I was passing that I have a fella. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It was really, really a wonderful moment. And you see how she's, she's so happy. She's glowing. She glows right out of the screen. And then the great scene in the park where they're having a picnic. And he has that monologue, monologue which, which he describes what it's like for him to be, my words, in the zone. When he knows he's going to win, he knows he can't miss. And, and she tells him two things, two very important things. She said, you're not a loser, you're a winner. And uh, she says, most, most, most men never get to have the feeling you have about that. And then she, what does she do? She says, I love you. Whoops. <laughs> and, and he, he doesn't, he, I think he says, do you need the words? And she, she sort of says, yes, but he doesn't give them to her. And then after that, things get very, very complex. Mm -hmm. could, I, could I throw in and just say, do you remember what, then what she says? She says, and if you ever say them to me, I'll never let you take them back. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yep. She really raises the stakes. I mean, everything just kind of goes up a notch in the film when what she's you think about the time that Myron McCormick knocks on the door and uh and wants to take him back out on the road and then he finds out that Myron McCormick had taken its 25 percent of the winnings and gets angry with him and then throws him out and there's a there's one shot of of uh Piper Laurie with a tear coming down her cheek because she sees she sees something in uh, in Fast Eddie, which which she is sorry about because this was a relationship, almost a father and son relationship, mm -hmm. and he's breaking it up, and she's she's moved by that. Well, enter enter big time, Bert Gordon and and, and uh, George C. Scott. A bad, a, a dark father figure. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, he's really, uh, and he makes, he, he talks Fast Eddie into the terrible deal with 75% of the winnings, take him back on the road. And now there's a, th there's a threesome problem here with, with uh, George C. Scott's character wanting to pull uh eddie on the road and she wants to obviously be part of his life and uh the the, the pull and the tug there is is rather it's in the beginning it's a little subtle but when they get down to louisville it becomes very 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 powerful and uh i've forgotten when he slaps her he slaps her at one point i i guess it was at the party in louisville or, or at the at the at, at the uh, at the Finley's place where he was playing billiards against that uh, uh, 
against Finley, the uh, Murray Hamilton character. Hmm. Does anybody remember the handshake shot? Does that mean anything to anybody? I guess not. It just jumped out at me. When when uh, they they've they've all gone down now to Louisville, as we know. And when uh, George C. Scott sees Finley, he goes over to shake his hand, and he he he, he reaches out like he doesn't shake his hand like this. He reaches out and just touches him. Like that. Remember that shot? That was just yeah. <laughs> really kind of brilliant directorial an actor's uh, input. I wonder whose idea that was, whether it was Rossin's or uh, or, or uh, Murray Hamilton's. I wonder if it's in the book. Yeah, I wonder. You know, just about his character being kind of a dilettante, oh, you I know. Don't. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, then everything really gets very thick. And we all know she goes back and she she writes she eventually goes to bed with uh with uh, with the devil if you will and uh, she writes perverted twisted crippled three words on the on the mirror and then she kills herself and it's, it's, she's lost all all self respect and she's ashamed and she's depressed and she's she does herself in. And that changes everything. That's well, when that's when Eddie realizes he really loved her. You know, he um, George C. Scott, his character also tells her that Eddie has said, you know, he's not coming back. Right. And so she feels she's abandoned at that point too. Exactly. She feels she's lost him. Yep. And those yes. words are a, are a callback, right? We've heard crippled, uh, we've heard those words before mm -hmm. in the film, right? Like just earlier, was it just earlier that evening or? I think it was earlier in the evening, but I can't remember. I don't remember yeah. when we heard them beforehand. Like when she, yeah. But she's, uh, right then we get to the final scene where Fast Eddie's going to go play Minnesota Fats, but he's not playing Minnesota Fats. He's also playing Bert Gordon. Yeah. And he uh, he he made remember he made the deal. I've got all the money I've got on the first game, three thousand dollars. If I lose the first game, it's over. If I win the first game, we'll play till we till I win. And of course the. Minnesota Fats eventually says the game's over. Yeah. And he won. And then, and then of course, is the, uh, the big final climactic scene where where Burt Gordon wants money from, wants, wants his cut. And, you know, you as an audience, you're sitting there saying, no, don't give it to him. Don't give it to him. You know, <laughs> you shouldn't do that. You're not going to do that. <clears throat> and of course, he doesn't. And he gets threatened with uh, bodily harm again. Then he says, then he says to him, if you if you send your goons after me again, your guys they they have to do it all. They have to kill me because if they don't, I'll put myself back to bed together again. I'll come back and I'll kill you. And then what's the last two lines in the movie, which is which were great lines. They're so simple, but uh, Minnesota Fats says as 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 he's leave, as as Paul Newman's leaving, he says. You play a great game of cool pool, Fast Eddie, and and Eddie says so do you, Fats, and he walks out. And uh, it's really, uh, really uh, an amazing again the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, the human drama of athletic competition. There it is. There it is. Yeah, there were uh, there were other there were other things we can talk a lot of other things we can talk about. Anybody right. want to bring something up? I'm sorry, I was just going to add uh, to the sports motif. You know, there are two people there that are famous sports figures. Jake LaMotta plays the bartender. Right. Eugene Bull himself, the prize fighter. And also Willie Moscone is the guy who holds the stake. Yeah, the I, I'm so proud of met people from the sports world, very famous in their respective, uh, you know, fields. Yeah. He's 14 times world champion. Yes. Moscone. 
Yes, exactly. What, what was his? What what was it? Oh, he was a pool player. Was he pool? No, he was a person who who held the stakes. He, he was held, in the, in the, 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 the money. Held the money. No, what is what was what what was he a fourteen? Uh, World billiards player, billiards oh, champ. Billiards. Yeah, billiards. Yeah, right. And he he, uh, he also apparently did some of the shots, close ups, of his hand right. on the right. table. But they say that uh, the word was that uh, uh, Jackie Gleason was a pretty darn good pool player, apparently. Whereas uh, uh, th there's a story I read where uh, Paul Newman and Jackie Gleason finally play a match between them. And, and uh, uh, Jackie Gleason beats him badly. They were playing for... 50 bucks or something and and uh, Newman paid him in pennies oh. <laughs> that's off five five or fifty thousand pennies or five thousand pennies or something he brought back I mean, there's another story that I heard which uh, I didn't didn't read anywhere but I, I heard from somewhere and it's probably true knowing New York City that the apparently uh, when they started filming in one of the uh, pool halls, one of the two pool halls, some goons came in who wanted to uh, have under the table money to uh, make sure that everything went smoothly. And uh, again, Rawson was so smart, he, had, he quietly told the fit cameras to roll on the scene so that when it was all over, he said, well, I've got it all on to film now. And so he out hustled the hustlers himself. <laughs> and they never had a problem. <laughs> it was great, very good. Mike, but, did you have a? Did yeah, I did. A... One, one question. I love the film, of course, black and white, and the music during the playing pool. And um, when it opened up, it really sold me because right across the street under the pool room was a car just like I had. Oh. I 15 oh, really? Chevy with the big wings. Yeah, yeah. I bought that up there in Saugerties in the 80s. I didn't have enough. Uh -huh. But uh, I was about 14 when that came out, and I was just about going up the pool room then myself in my neighborhood pool room. And it had everything. It looked great, except it was a lot cleaner than mine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it had the beads on the top where you push them over and, ho and hold everything. Sure. And we used to play nine ball and uh, straight pool. I couldn't understand what the 125 was. They would say uh, 125 game. Now, how did they do that? 125 adding up the balls or? Must have been them adding up the balls. Must have been okay. adding And uh, another thing was uh, when he went to Louisville to play um, Bert, I think his name was. Bert the, said all of a sudden, yeah, we're playing billiards. And I didn't yeah. understand the rules of billiards at that point. Never played them. So I wondered, wondered if you knew that, Doug. It was a different game. I, I don't know the rules of billiards, but it's, I know it's a different game and there aren't pockets. It's a different different game entirely, which is, of course, why Bert uh, Gordon was uh, hesitant to have uh, uh, Fast Eddie play the game because he, did, he didn't think he was good enough at that mm -hmm. game. It reminded me something like a bocce ball almost. You, you hit the rag and then you get closest to the ball. I'm not sure that's it. I, I never looked it up yet. Something like that. Something like that. I'll tell you a, a story about, you all remember Jim McKay from Wide World of Sports and from the Olympics? Yeah. He once came back on a plane from the coast and by coincidence was was with, uh, was with uh, Paul Newman in the front of the plane. Of course, they... Yeah in the front of the plane and they hit it off real well and there were two things two things i heard i heard one thing where the the, the stewardess was trying to sort of hit on paul newman and she <laughs> and she came she was trying to impress him and she said to him uh you uh i under i i noticed that all your most of your movies begin with the letter h i wonder what the meaning for that is and he looked up at her and he said it's because I'm a homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> Good sense of humor. 
<laughs> and they, get, they, get, they get to New York, and Jim McKay is met by his daughter, Mary, and he introduces uh, Paul Newman to Mary, of course. And then Mary and Jim are walking to the car, and Mary says to Jim, Dad, your eyes are bluer than Paul Newman's. <laughs> which, which is, again, the, the point that was just made about the, the, the movie being in black and white. Mm -hmm. that was the same movie if it were in color. Wouldn't that was a great, great decision. Yeah. 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 Make it black and white. And they also shot it in Cinemascope. Yeah. Right. So that's, Supposedly, that's, they wanted to be sure to show some of the shots were done with, not, not with just a tight shot on hands, but on bodies, the full body shot uh, showing the showing them making the shot in, in the table. So well, yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of that tracking shot when we're watching Sarah slowly, oh, slowly descend the stairs in uh -huh. Louisville. And she even stops and gets exchanges her empty cup for another cup and it just stays on her until she's in the midst of that party. And it's just like you, you just you can feel she's just descending on the hill. Yeah. Drunk, drunk. yeah. Funny too. And it's funny too. There was a moment there was a moment back when they were uh making love with each other, uh when he had his uh, thumbs broken that she didn't have a drink. Mm -hmm. she, yes. didn't, she didn't right. drink uh at that point uh, as much anyway. It was interesting. And then, then of course, she thought it was all over. And it was I don't think she was drinking at all then, Doug, because I think she, he asked at one point, didn't he, if she wanted a drink, and she said no. And it, then he stopped from that. His thumbs weren't broken because he was able to get a drink then. But that's that's that whole period where she really started to turn around and think there was hope. But... Yeah. I'm reflecting back on when you asked of when she got slapped, and I wonder if anybody else remembers that, because I'm thinking it was after his first um, manager came into the apartment, and they had that argument, and Paul Newman threw him out, mm -hmm. and he said something. Think, Didn't he strike I her then in the yeah, apartment? Yeah, I, I it was definitely in the apartment. Yes, that's what it was. Yeah, it was in the apartment. And was, and was, uh, I thought it was in Louisville. Oh, it, it was in the and her response blew me away. That would you expect me to cry? Oh yeah, wow. yeah. She was a good actor. Yeah, but it was also that point where she realized that you know, as much as she thought there could be something more meaningful, that um. He, he he was just out. He needed yeah. to do this hustle, and he needed to to beat Minnesota Fats. You know, like yeah. she wasn't going to be able to turn him around. Right. Yeah, and that scene where she's drunk and she's typing on the typewriter. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. I'm watching that going. You know, this is this is a whole. This is a whole per female persona that's coming out here that 1961, you know, you just didn't see that, you know, and then, and she was just so, um, I don't know, she was so out of his league. <laughs> that's how oh, it was to me, that she, he, around her, he seemed more childlike, even in his immaturity when that hustle went wrong you know he was like she says you're too hungry you know when he was giving her a good night kiss or something she's just like you're too hungry i mean she really knew him so well and i think that's what was so that was what was so profound when they're in louisville and she's been sleeping off her you know being so drunk and she goes down and sees what he's doing. Um, yep, yep. I have to uh, 
right on what Katie said too, because I was surprised that there was a character, a female character with that much depth at that time. You have Eva Marie Saint in On the Waterfront and you have Natalie Wood in Rebel Without a Cause. And of course, Eva Marie Saint's character was as pure as snow and so beautiful and nothing taint, could ever taint her. And Natalie Wood's character was a little more complicated, but still, she was still a really good girl and very pretty. But this character was, whoa, right. definitely broken in so many ways. And right. it, it kind of blew my mind. Yeah, <laughs> that was. It's a great. She didn't do another picture for 15 years. Yeah, wow. that, that blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. well, Matt, what was then up she, with that? Then she went, well, she wanted to raise her daughter and uh, she wanted to get involved in some public uh, things. She was against the Vietnam War and other things that she barely took some uh, a, prominent. Uh, well, good for her. Yeah. And uh, she uh, uh, then she she played the Carrie's. She got the part of Carrie's mother. Somebody oh. said, and she, oh yeah, and she uh, and she got a was an and she might even have won an Oscar for that, but I, I I'm not sure whether she won it or not, but she was nominated for sure. She was uh, also in Twin Peaks, I think. Yeah, David yeah. Lynch, of course, David Lynch is going to you know honor her. Yeah. Sure, of course. I mean, from the minute you see her in the bus station, you're like, what is the deal? And then she's yeah. at the bar. Yeah. You're just like, wow. I and he's a hustler. He comes on to her and she knows from the get go what he's about. And she's so tough. She doesn't let it affect her. She just gives it right back to him. I was very impressed. Yeah. Oh, she Two steps ahead of him. She knew that yeah. she would find him in the bar. She knew where, right where to be. Yeah. yeah. She, <laughs> when, when it, and she, he says, I'll get a bottle of scotch. And she says, what do you want me to do? Step out in the alley? Yeah, it was good. Yeah. That's the best, <laughs> the best lines. Oh, my gosh. The writing was incredible because oh. Carol and Rawson wrote, wrote the screenplay and Rawson produced and directed the movie. It was all his baby. Mm -hmm. It was like his comeback film because he had won the Oscar for all the King's men. And yeah. then, you know, and then the fifties, you know, he did body and soul with John Garfield, but then, you know, with Huack, he could not, he couldn't earn a living. Um, well, maybe maybe we should talk about that a little bit because yeah. maybe there's some of that in the in the picture because he certainly never liked the 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 pure greed of capitalism, which is if there is a bad side to capitalism, that's probably it. He he he. Uh, Bert Gordon represents that greed. Mm -hmm. did, he did everything for money. He didn't care about his people. Didn't get, remember at the end he says you're dead inside. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you're you're a loser because you're dead inside. Yeah. Not about anybody basically. And uh, I know Michael, you have some feelings about that. I think. You had um, some. Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, uh, Rawson is uh, probably the most uh, interesting and paradoxical uh, case of directors and screenwriters of the of the HUAC uh, hearings. He's someone that, you know, was a member of the Communist Party. Uh, he left, I think, as you pointed out to me earlier, Doug, in 1949. So he did so uh, earlier, you know, and I mean, you know, but stayed in the party during the whole Stalinist period and the post-World War uh, period. Um, and he was one of the Hollywood 19 uh, brought forward. Uh, he was not convicted. He was able to plead the fifth. Uh, for two years, he hired uh, Edward Bennett Williams, who became, you know, one of the most famous trial attorneys, uh, as his lawyer to help him, you know, orchestrate performances in Congress. Very interesting that Edward Bennett Williams ultimately began. He became uh, Bobby Baker's uh, lawyer in the Lyndon Johnson case and became one of the greatest 
you know, criminal uh, defense attorneys on on K Street in Washington. But at this time, he was a little, you know, kind of storefront lawyer, but very well known for, you know, his uh, agility in the courtroom and and uh, briefing witnesses. Um, anyway, Rosin um, in 53 uh, kind of made a reverse turn. You know, he he named uh, 57 names and, and then himself 58 uh -huh. and the and uh, this was really uh, disheartening, particularly to some uh, uh, someone like Albert Maltz, who and, and even Trumbo, you know, at that time too, who you know uh, was was going down and had a very hard time uh, working. Of which you know he's been Trumbo has been brought back as a kind of icon of that period with the the recent uh, film. So um, to me, yeah, he he didn't work for seven years. He was kind of you know, ostracized by a lot of his friends on the left. They would go to places and people would point, you know, uh, we don't talk to him because he named names. There, these kind of, you know, very bad associations were around Rosson. So I read the film at one level as a kind of redemption film, you know, in the character of Fast Daddy, that somehow Rosson as projecting, you know, Bert Gordon as HUAC, as the worst forms of, you know, the dullest CIA, you know, McCarthyist period post World War II in a way, and that Bert Gordon actually represents that in a very microcosmic way, and uh, that um, uh, the the hustle itself was also part of this this moment. How do we get out of you know not betraying our friends, but at the same time being able to still work? And he made a statement. I wrote down a statement. Uh, you know, I've done some research on. Rosin all, all the years. He said something to the effect of, um, uh, let me see if I can find it. I think it's a very interesting quote where he said, um, I, 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 would, I, I changed my mind because of a changed political um, circumstances. I could no longer indulge myself and in the luxury of individual morality, which was kind of very interesting. This was his statement in 1953, which I think plays very well to this individualized sense of morality and as you mentioned at your beginning Doug the the uh, you know the agony of defeat well to me it's the yeah. agony of victory in this film you know uh, the the, the program of one of the sports was really to me much more about the agony of victory that the agonistics in the Greek sense of competition anxiety you know uh, this this very deep feeling of how hard it is to win and to have that victory. So in, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm, you know, projecting a lot onto this film of Rawson's, you know, history with the HUAC, but he was, he was a very well-known, uh, um, you know, uh, director before, as Katie mentioned, one body and soul with John Carfield was extremely well-received. He was a very much in demand director. All the King's men won hands down and still was one of the great, I think one of the greatest political films ever made. I come from New Orleans, so we know Huey Long, we know <laughs> Robert yeah. Ted Warren, the novel very well. Um, so, you know, he was really riding high during this period and he had a lot to lose, you know, as did many of the other people in the Hollywood 10. But Rawson was, to me, the, the most contradictory and paradoxical of all, because his son said he thinks that this killed him, you know, ultimately, this kind of ostracism, that he was unable to work. And going back to this notion of the broken woman early on, or the, you know, the Piper Laurie character, the very intelligent but extremely troubled women, woman. So his last film was Lilith. You know, which mm -hmm. was about a, a woman in a you know a psychiatric institution. You know that Warren yeah. Beatty plays the, the role in. So, so for me, there are many, many complexities here uh, that are that are working out. I mean, I can go on and on. I don't want to, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've studied this film for many, many years, and I see a kind of, you know, you also talked about the threesomes. I think the film works on triangulation. You know, the original triangulation of the Mark, Charlie, and Fast Eddie. Then the triangulation of the fat man, Charlie and Fast Eddie. Then right. the, the triangulation of Bert, Bert and uh, Gordon, uh, Eddie, Fast Eddie, and, and, and Minnesota Fats. Then, of right. course, Piper Laurie, you know, Sarah, um, um, George C. Scott, and Fast Eddie. And then yeah. even ending up that way, you play a great game of pool, uh, Fast Eddie. You know, <laughs> so do you, Fat Man. You know, at, at the end, it kind of resolves you know, that this was a, a film about, as you said, sports, pool, 
hustling, but at the same time, so many levels, you know, that one can see in it. And another yeah. thing that struck me that's very, very, uh, I don't think really been commented upon um, actively is, is the theatrical uh, feeling to the film. This was something like Playhouse 90 almost, especially the end scene where everybody kind of goes off stage a little bit. You can see it, this very long take of Jackie Gleason putting back on his coat, walking a little bit out, Bert going off, the other characters, Michael Constantine and others, all kind of working off the, walking off the stage. And I'm reminded very much, I don't know if people know Shirley Clark's The uh, Connection, made from the Jack Gelber um, um, uh, play. But, uh, you know, very much that kind of theatrical approach to cinema during that time that Rawson really, to me, has a, you know, an enormous mastery of, you know. And, and speaking of women, Dee Dee Allen was probably one of the greatest uh, uh, film editor. editors of this period. I mean, really unbelievable. You know, Rawson is a, a proto-feminist in all senses in my no, yeah, I gave him awards for, for the editing of that movie. She, yes, yes. she was one of the great, great editors. She edited edited Reds. I mean, just Very that good. alone, oh, taking good. Warren yeah. Beatty's. <laughs> <Right. laughs> was seen a great scene that was cut from the movie, which was a scene that was uh, uh, one for Paul Newman, where he has a monologue in the uh, in the pool hall somewhere, and yeah. and it was cut, and they were they debated Ross Ross and debated. Uh, uh, Alan a lot about whether to put it in or not, and Rosson just felt it, it held up the flow of the movie, and so it never made it to the uh, to the final cut. Yeah. Oh, so Dee Dee Allen wanted yeah. the scene. No, that's, she wanted. It. Yeah, she wanted it. That's unusual. That and, is very unusual for a filmmaker. <laughs> it's usually the opposite, where the editor is begging the filmmaker to take out a scene. Take it out. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. But, and uh, also, it was, there was a, a suggestion on Paul Newman's part. Some some uh, columnist wrote that he thought that if that if that scene had been put in the picture, he would have won the Oscar. Uh, oh boy! Sure? Okay. <laughs> Where do we get this Missing scene? Monologue. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Paul, Paul, did you? Yeah. Hi Doug. Hi Kate. How old how old were in, were those two guys during the film? How old was 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 Paul Newman? Paul Newman? Gosh, I don't know, but he was young. <laughs> um we could probably figure it out. Figure out what year it was when he was born. Google in it. You will find it. It's <laughs> easy enough to look up. Yeah. Um, well, he was born 1925, and this 36. was made in 61. 36. 36. 36. 36 years old, yeah. Um, but he acted like he was 25. They're good genes. Yeah, yeah he certainly did, yeah. And yeah. another thing to consider is that um, I was reading in David Thompson's um, book, um, film book, that Rawson was sick during yeah. the making of this film he was he during, suffered from diabetes and he was drinking heavily um so that's also kind of a that's an interesting interesting kind of perspective is this film through someone who is is sick you sick. know directing he's still working hard but he's sick yeah he, he, it came on him during the film I don't think he was sick when he started it, but it, but he got sick during the film. During it, yeah. And weeks. another thing that six, was interesting. Weeks. They shot it in six weeks. Um, really? That's, that's fast. Yeah, it was very fast. Um, yeah. the to kind of go back to you, Michael. The um, I read that the um, the the communist party, um, in Los Angeles. Had den when all the king's men came out, they they denounced it publicly, and that's and this was like late forties, and that's when Rawson yeah, started yeah. trying to mm -hmm. not, you know, was like, what's this about, you know? Right. Uh, 
a similar thing happened with Emilio D'Antonio, who did the yeah. film The Year of the Pig. He said they yeah. were telling me how to make films. Yeah. And he didn't like that, even though he was a member in the 50s and the early 60s. He said, right. this is for me in terms of the dogma and, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, Marxist uh, uh, film studies and literary studies, that's, you know, the Stakhanov mentality of the party. You write yeah. for the party, you don't write about, you know, individual things, you know. So in a way, yeah, it's interesting at, at, at the level that, you know, most of the, the, the um, at least what I know of the film criticism about The Hustler takes it as, as an exemplary moment in psychological realism, which was very active during that period. You know, this is, yeah, it was part of what, what happened, uh, you know. Uh, I even discovered a new film term that I had never heard before called film greed which is gray film, which gray I film. I'd, I'd never, I'd yeah. never heard that. And right. that's what this was considered, I guess, in sort of like there's film noir, this, so this is film, film gray. Um, the, the very fact he did a tease was unique. Mm -hmm. he, he had a scene before opening credits that was never done before then. Yeah. But I don't, I think it was the very first time that, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, and they established, of course, then it became something that was every now and then people did, but, but uh, it's always good to be first. <laughs> How many people saw The Color of Money? Color of Money. Hmm. What was yeah. that again? Not recently, but yeah. Yeah, little... I, I saw it when it first came out, but, um, it ain't Jack Gleason and it ain't George C. Scott, unfortunately. No. <laughs> Didn't have the same depth or the, you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's like it's Godfather like, Part Three without yeah, Robert Duvall. Like all the King's Men <laughs> with Sean Penn instead of Roderick Car Crawford. You know, yeah. Just not the same. No, it same didn't. Thing. I'm Tom sorry. Just didn't get so it. Just pure, didn't. Pure, but yeah. Or Richard Gere instead of Jean Paul Belmondo in Breathless, you know. <laughs> so anyway. And didn't didn't Newman win the Oscar as sort of a consolation prize for not getting it back when he should have? Did he? Let me look. I'm, yeah, I'm pretty that's, sure. that's, that's, he did pretty win sure. the Oscar. He did win the Oscar. Yes. The color of yeah. money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which was ridiculous. Money. He won the yeah, Oscar. I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting too because that opening scene of the first hustle. The way they did it, I've seen that so many times in other things, but I had never seen the original. And it's always fascinating to see where it all starts from. That that whole trope has been used in TV shows and other movies all the time. Mm -hmm, sure. And you know, yeah, that's that's great. Why you consider it a sports film? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. why you consider it one of the greatest sports films? I'm just very interested in you know how you get there, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. Well, that was, me, my question. that was a question to me. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Uh, when I was with Wide World of Sports, we covered some billiards championships. So to me, it was a sport. Yes. Huh. Okay. So that's all. It was just another kind of sport. It wasn't a sport where you had to get in shape. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, That's the in shape. So yeah, the fat man dances around the table, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they a violin player, yeah. To, in order to get the shot looking down over the table, we had to put a mirror in the ceiling and shoot up uh -huh. at the mirror. Wow. And reverse yeah. polarity so that it would uh, left to right would be right to left. Okay. And, and uh, it was quite an operation on the part of the engineers to do that. Huh. Okay. So the wide world of sports actually covered billiards, but yes. never got to understand the game. That surprises me, I think, a bit, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> you everything you did, you know? Well, there we were know, lots of sports that wide world covered that they didn't understand. <laughs> What's that? There were lots of sports that wide world covered that they didn't, nobody could understand. <laughs> Remember Jack World Championships? The, <laughs> the, you know, the, the barrel jumping at Gross Singers. Yeah, <laughs> All those weirdo side by sideways things. That's, That's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> there were a lot of those. There was, in the early days, there was a rattlesnake hunt. 
Oh yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Did I missed that one. To do yeah. that in the every very early in the, only once. <laughs> Please. But anyway, well, listen, it's it's eight o'clock, everybody. <laughs> Does anyone gosh. have any other thoughts or questions or any questions about Doug working for being a producer, director, producer. Oh, Doug, do tell tell a Howard Cosell story. Oh yeah, which one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you. There's there's a couple of them that are great. Yeah. One of them, one of them is very quick. When I was made producer, uh, promoted to producer, he stopped me in the hallway. He put his arm around me. He looks down at me and he says, "Doug Wilson." Young man, many faceted talents, <laughs> imagination. You're going a long way in this business. And I was really flattered by it. Uh, obviously, you don't get a compliment from him that much. So I looked up at him. He's about 6'2 with his hairpiece and everything. <laughs> I said, and I said, Coach, we called him Coach. I get Coach, I'll always live in your shadow. He says, My boy, that's impossible. I cast no shadow. <laughs> <laughs> the great story, though, the real great story was uh, uh, one that Bal Michaels told me. It has to do with a moment uh, uh, out in uh, uh, Kansas City during a time when ABC did Monday Night Baseball, a brief time. We had a couple of years of Monday Night Baseball. And uh, he was coming back from rehearsal on Sunday night and they had stopped to have dinner and he'd had a couple of martinis and they were going in their limo back to the hotel and they were going through a bad part of town. They stopped at a light and he looked down a side street and there were some black guys fighting and young men fighting. And he said to the driver, my good woman, take me down that street. And she said, that's not a good idea, Mr. Cosell. She was a, she said, uh, this is a bad part of town and we shouldn't do this. But he does. He goes, they drive down, slowly down the street and they stop and the kids stop fighting. And you imagine out of the back seat steps Howard Cosell in his polo coat and his cigar. And they, it's like the Pied Piper of Hamlin has arrived. So they, they, they stop fighting and he goes right into his act. He says, the young man with his back against the curb obviously is not perfected his uppercut, this fight will cease. <laughs> <laughs> Holds court for another couple of minutes, and then he says, I must, my colleagues await me in my limousine, gentlemen, I must be prepared in my, my hotel. And he starts to walk away, the kids walk away, and one guy, one, one of the young men follows him, gets to the car and said, and says, yes, what is it, young man? He's, what is it? And he says, he says, if it hadn't been you, we'd have killed you. <laughs> he says, he says, he says, I'm aware of that young man. And he gets back in the car, sits back, and they're driving away. And the driver says, I don't believe what I just saw. And Cosell sits back, takes a puff of his cigar, and says, I know who I am. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, they don't make it like that anymore. No, no well, he was one of a kind, believe me. Yeah. Have you, got any, have you got an evil can evil story? A quick one? Uh evil can evil story, sure. Um we after he had uh I went to, to uh do a show called Evil Can Evil Portrait of a Daredevil. And uh we uh went to his he was he wanted to show me his he had built himself an office in Butte of stone. And he wanted to show it to me. And uh, he, he, my camera crew was with me and we went into this, and in the middle of this uh, office, of uh, this uh, room was a full size bank vault with, with a big wheel on it and a big, you know, big, huge bank vault. And he went and opened up the bank vault and inside was a gold plated motorcycle covered in cash just cash. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe it and he closed it up and then he goes to a back room and i 
You know, he was obsessed, of course, with lining things up. When, when he lined up the jumps, he spent a lot of time making sure everything was lined up perfectly. So I told the guys, let's have some fun. We went around the room and tilted the pictures a little bit. <laughs> a lot of pictures and posters up there. Just a little bit, just enough. And he comes back in the room and he's, <laughs> and he's, he's getting a little bit uh, funny. He doesn't know what's wrong. And he looks around and he says, oh, who did it? Who did it? And he immediately went around and straightened up all the pictures. <laughs> he uh, he also uh, took us for a joy ride out on on uh, was it as was it Highway 15? I think it's Inter Interstate 15. I think it's the interstate that goes around Butte. And he has a um, Maserati that he put us all in. <clears throat> I'm in the front seat. Look, a couple of guys in the back seat. And he does 140 miles an hour on this foot. Oh yeah. my God. I'm, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking this, the headline's gonna read Evil Knievel and three others die. <laughs> <laughs> and he would, he, but he knew how to drive it. He, he, um, he'd go to pass a truck, but he would start to pass it way, way before we got there. And uh, I, I knew that. He also took us down the opening of the show, I opened up the show in the uh, Anaconda Copper Mines that were there a mile down into the surface of the earth. And I, he, he made arrangements for us to, uh, to do that. There's a, there's a lo local legendary story, uh, which I'm sure is true, that um, his name was Bob Robert Craig Evil Knievel, or Robert Craig Knievel. And he was he was working uh, the copper mines, and he was driving one of those big trucks where the the wheel of the truck is six feet in diameter. You know those huge, huge things. And he load up they load up uh, a, a load of bauxite and then dump it somewhere by a railroad cars. Well, the foreman didn't like Bob, as they called him then. Didn't like Bob Knievel, and threatened and said, "I'm watching you." You better be. You better not screw around. I guess he'd probably stolen some something from him or something, done something uh, that, that uh, the foreman didn't like. So the next time around, he he goes out of the line, backs up to the foreman's shack, and dumps the whole load on the foreman's shack. Oh, wow! Then he drives into town, parks the car in front of a bar, goes in and waits to get arrested. <laughs> He, Man. he has he has quite a history of being in jail in Butte. <laughs> <laughs> and there's more stories in Doug's book, which I highly <laughs> recommend. It's at the library, but you can also get it on Amazon. The world was our stage. I mean, ABC Wild World of Sports, I watched with my dad. That was what I did. That was our bonding. <laughs> well, I've had some, I had a couple of, once I had a lady come after I did a little presentation, she had tears in her eyes saying, I was so glad to see some of this because it reminded me of when I bonded with my father, watching watching White World. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of young women did that. It was yeah. crazy. I was to my, my father and brothers, you know, every week. Yep. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Doug. Well, thank you all. <laughs> thank Thanks. you, Doug. Thank you, Katie. And Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doug and Kate. Uh, so much fun. Thank you all so much for for uh, for gathering and talking. This was just wonderful. Um, and I'll, I'm doing another one in February, so I'll I'll send out an email about it. <laughs> what film are you doing in February? Do you know yet? Excuse me. What, what film are you doing in February? Have you chosen it well, yet? Yeah, actually, in February, I am going to be talking to a really close friend of mine, Sashi Bogdanovich, and we are going to be talking about her mother, Polly Platt, who was production designer on, new, you know, of course, her dad's films, Peter Bogdanovich. Um, she was also a producer and, um, and a screenwriter. So we picked her three favorite films, um, What's Up, Doc? 
was her favorite film to be to do production design on. I was kind of surprised, but okay. Um, one of her favorite films she produced was Just Say Anything. And um, and a film, a controversial film that she wrote the screenplay to was Pretty Baby. So oh. we'll be looking at all, all three of those films and talking about what it was like. I mean, her mom was a real trailblazer. Um, not a lot of women working in the industry you know, in the 60s and 70s, as far as in back of the camera. So we'll be talking about that too. Um, so that should be fun. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. 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 Thank